that means we're hid with Christ in God because when Jesus went back and sat down at the right hand of the Father, we sat down with him. We died with him. We was resurrected with him. And now we ascended with him and we sat down with him. That is our rest. This is the Words of Life broadcast with your host, Reverend Raymond Beard, pastor and founder of the Jackson Revival Center Church Incorporated, located in Jackson, Mississippi. The Words of Life broadcast is a ministry dedicated to reconciling man to God and to building the body of Christ by revealing to man God's love and grace through an uncompromised truth. We encourage you to open your Bibles and join us as Pastor Beard uncovers hidden truths and reveals a more practical approach to everyday victorious living. Now, today's message. I'm excited this morning. How many can say I'm excited too? It's such a great privilege to be able to hold a microphone in your hand and say, I'm going to preach the unadulterated Word of God, which the Word of God is light and it puts out darkness and Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, going all of the way to the joint of the mire of the bone. So everybody say, I thank God for His Word, for His everlasting covenant. So God is real. Turn around and shake hands with someone, and then you may be seated. Amen. So I want to just talk to you before we get into the depth of the Word of God. You're precious. You are precious in the sight of God. You are the apple of God's eye. God loved you so much until before you were ever born, He gave His only begotten Son for you. The church is composed of the called out ones. You did not seek Him, but He sought you. And let me say, number two, you were given to Jesus by the Almighty God. And because you were given to Jesus by the Almighty God, the Scripture says He's not going to lose a one. But He's going to raise you up at the last day. So I'm just going to let you know today that you are a winner no matter how you feel. He called you because he wants you to bear lasting fruit. He wants fruit that will remain. And so God wants you to have knowledge of him in order that you can bear fruit because my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Knowledge is not only knowing something mentally, but knowing something spiritually. Uh, The Bible said that Joseph knew not Mary until after Jesus was born. That meant that he did not know her. How many know what I'm talking about? He knew her name, but he had not experienced a relationship. Are you listening? There's a difference in knowing about someone and knowing them. And so we have a lot of people that know about him, but they're not experiencing him. So it's when you taste of him that you know he's good. You can hear about him and go commit suicide. But you can taste of him and realize what life is all about. He didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but he came to the world that the world through him might be saved. Isn't that wonderful? He was perfect. He never committed a sin. There was no guile in his mouth, but he come not into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. And the Bible said that God is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so we have a shaking going on in the world today. I was noticing on the news this morning uh, how that um, Hussein was condemned. And they condemned him to be hung. Until he is dead, dead, dead. And I was thinking what a feeling it must be to stand before a judge and say, I condemn you. Your life will no longer exist. I condemn you to be hung until you're dead. That's not a good feeling to be condemned. But here's the good thing about Jesus. He come not into the world to condemn the world. 
but that the world through him might be saved. And I'm seeing some things going on in the world today that really challenges me to preach a message of repentance and to tell the world that God's not against you, he's for you. But at the same time, if you will not receive him and you walk in darkness, that's your choice. Now this is the condemnation that light has come and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. You should not run from God because your deeds are evil. You should run to him because your deeds are evil. Because he didn't come into the world to save the people that didn't have sin. He came into the world to save sinners. And so the enemy does not want sinners to come to him. You know, in the church today, we cannot confess our sins either. No, I'm talking about Christians. Cannot confess their sins. I I really hate to be so open with this, but I have to. We have a lot of sin in the church around the world. Now, we have a lot of people that have failed. They didn't want to fail, but they did. But we have a lot of people that have failed, and they cannot come clean like they want to because they don't have anybody to talk to. It's important to have other Christians that you can talk to. Uh, Notice how that we don't have enough jail cells to take care of the criminals. I'm wondering what would happen if those criminals had someone to talk to before they committed the crime. There's something going on in the world today. uh, There's something missing. Because I don't believe the gang members want to be there. Maybe some of them do. I don't believe the girl on the street wants to be there. I, I don't believe the person begging on the street wants to be there. I I, I wanted to weep the other day. My heart went out. I saw a man pushing a buggy. And when I looked on what was on the buggy, I, I, I just, my heart bled. Because I'm thinking, my Lord, there's nothing on the buggy that's worth anything. I saw another young man. He was pushing I call them buggies. I, uh, you know, he's, I don't know if he stole it or what, but it's one of these little buggies you push in a grocery store. And I noticed that in the buggy was cans, Coke cans, Sprite cans. You know what I'm talking about, just cans. And I stopped and I said, young man, how much will all you have in the buggy bring? He had a few other things besides cans. And he said, I'm hoping to get $5. And I thought, here we are in this world. Some of us have more. You understand what I'm talking about? We do have a house to live in. We do have a refrigerator. Um, We have more than what we ever expected to have. But sometimes we're unthankful. But if you're on the street and you don't have anything but a buggy to push and you've got to go pick up a can here and you pick up a can there and you pick up something here and there and that's your livelihood, they don't want to be there. But you see, they can't find a way out because they don't have anybody to help them out. I'm convinced that people want a chance. Now, some people are not going to make it regardless as to what you offer them. And I'm getting to a point. Because God's love went out to humanity. And the scripture tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I'd like for you to think with me for a moment. How much do you love your son? How many in this room has a son? Or a daughter. I'm trying to just show you how that you love a son or how you love a daughter. And the scripture tells us that Jesus never committed a sin. I mean, there was no cause for the father to say, I'll offer my son for the sins of the world. 
He was an obedient son. He was righteous. In fact, he created the world. But God looked up on humanity and he loved humanity so much until he said, I want to give them a chance at what life is all about. I'm not going to, to look upon their sin. I'm not going to reward them according to their iniquities because I'm just, I just love them. And so I'm going to give something for humanity. I'm going to give my son, my only begotten son. I want you to think about this. And so God says, I've got to give my son in order that I can save the world. Anyway, what I'm saying is that God took one in order to save all. His love, even though it was his son, God took one in order to save all. It would be very difficult if it was your son and you love him so much, but you're going to have to let him die because if you don't, others will perish. That's not easy. That, that, that's, a, that's a heart that goes out for others instead of that that you love more than anything else. But you want to be fair and you want to be just. I told God, I was, and I repent, I repent of this all the time. I told people a few years ago that if before I was born, I would have had a chance to say to God, Lord, now, if you're going to let me be born and I fail, I make mistakes, and you're going to burn me in hell forever, please don't let me be born. You understand what I'm talking about? And so I'm saying to God, it's unfair for you to let people be born unless you take the responsibility for them being born. It's not right for a person to be born into the world and not have a chance at eternal life. It would be better they were never born if they have to be born and go to an everlasting hell. And God, knowing that, God said, I'm going to take care of the situation. It's true that I'm responsible for the devil that I created that deceived Adam and Eve. But I'm going to go down and undo what he did. By the first man, Adam, all shall die. But by the second man, Adam, shall all be made alive. And so I want you to know that when Jesus come, the second Adam, he come to undo what the first man, Adam, did by giving his only begotten son. And now God says, I'm going to give you a choice. He give Adam and Eve a choice. He give them a choice to either accept life or death. But they chose death. And when they chose death, God chose life for you. God come to give you life and that more abundantly. And he makes it so easy. It says that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So the church is composed of the called out. You did not call him. You did not seek him, but he sought you. And I want to tell you something. You are what God gave to the son. And whenever God gave you to the Son, He did not give you to the Son of God for you to be lost. He said, Them that my Father has given unto me shall come unto me. See, when you get under conviction and come to God, it's not because you were so good. It's because you were given unto God from the foundation of the world. I know this gets into some deep water for some folks, but God gave you to Jesus before you ever got here. Isn't that wonderful? God chose us from the foundation of the world, and I'll read that to you momentarily. So if we, if we are the church that have been called out, and if we are the ones that was given unto Jesus by the Father, then how come that we cannot become rooted and grounded in that truth alone? Because I believe if we get rooted and grounded as sons, we'll produce the fruit of a son. And the reason that so many people are not bearing fruit is because they don't know who they are. And therefore, they're almost like the woman on the street. Or they're like the little boy that's pushing the, the cart with cans in it. They have not learned that they have success if they will enter into the relationship that God has offered us. You don't have to stay where you are. There's help when you come to God. There may not be the help that we're looking for in this world, even though we know there's a lot of help in this world if people will seek it and if they will find it. 
But a lot of people don't know where to go. They don't know how to go. But God has given us a way to where he said, I am the way and I am the truth and I am the light. You, you see, when you come to God, it doesn't make any difference how poor you are or, or how, uh, what, all the, what, what you like. When you come to God, he said, I'm made unto you wisdom and righteousness. And when you come to the Lord, he begins to take hold of your life as being the shepherd. And he's the one that wants to shepherd you and the one that wants to help you and the one that wants you to understand what your inheritance is. And so I want to go into two of the greatest books in the Bible today. I cannot tell you how much that I appreciate the book of Ephesians and how much I appreciate the book of Colossians. And then how much I appreciate the book of Romans and how I just appreciate the whole Bible. <laughs> you understand? But some things just stand out and some things just leap out at, at me uh, when I begin to read and when I begin to look into the scriptures. And uh, so before we go into that, though, let me confirm to you what I'm talking about in St. John chapter 15, verse 16 and 17. Where Jesus said, you have not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you. Now, it's one thing for you to be chosen and ordained. So you are ordained for a specific reason. I have some right now wanting me to ordain them. In fact, I had a meeting this week and talked to a precious person that... Uh, explained to me, you know, how that they want to work for God and how they want to live for God and, and how that, uh, you know, they, they want to be ordained for their calling. And I was amazed and uh, uh, deep inside, and I'm thinking, I'm so glad you're telling me this. Because this person said to me, sometime I tell my husband, you're probably here listening, but that's all right. Sometime I tell my husband, Brother Beard don't know who I am. And I said, honey, you just don't know how I watch you all the time. I watch you. I'm watching your fruit. I'm watching your desire. I'm watching your faithfulness. I'm watching you. And sometimes we're that, we're, we feel that way about God. We feel like he's not watching us. But I want to tell you that God's watching you. And God's going to ordain you for that that he's ordained you to be according to his purpose. Isn't that wonderful? One thing about God, he will not wrongfully ordain you. A lot of people want to be ordained, but they don't know what they want to be ordained for. But God had a purpose in this scripture. And he said, you have not chosen me, but I've chosen you. And ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. Watch it. And that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. If you really analyze this scripture, you're going to find out that God does not want you to be a beggar. Why? Because what God has ordained you for is to bear lasting fruit. Can I read this scripture again? You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. And watch this, watch this, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you. And then he said that you love one another. When you begin to understand what we've been ordained for, number one, he chose us. We didn't choose him. Now, if God chose you, wouldn't you believe this, that he chose you for his purpose? If God chooses you for his purpose, you can believe this, he will not lose his purpose. And that's why the Bible said, no man shall be able to pluck the called out ones out of my hand. Because my father gave them to me. And no man can pluck them out of my Father's hand because he's greater than all. If you will understand that when you come to God, it was God drawing you that you could not come by yourself. And if God called you to himself, he did not call you to himself to lose you. My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. So you can be a child of God and still be destroyed physically. Because you have not learned the purpose of God. That's why it's important that you learn the purpose of God. 
to study, to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed is very important. That's why a lot of people have a zeal, but not according to knowledge. You, we have a lot of Christians that they're wonderful people, but try to teach them the word of God and they're gone. They're flaky. I'm not calling you flaky because you want to believe God. I'm calling you that if you don't take the word of God and let it, let it be your guideline, you can enter into a place that you don't need to be. My people is stored for the lack of knowledge, and God's word is knowledge. If any man like wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like the waves of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. And let not the double-minded man deceive himself in thinking he shall receive anything from the Lord. So there's a place that we have to come to that we're positive when we come to him. Uh, Hebrews 11 and 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For they that come to him must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. When you see who you are in God's purpose, you're going to know if God ordained you that you bring forth fruit, that God is there to help you do the birthing. You cannot give what you do not have. But something has to be birthed in you before you can have it. I was thinking about the dream that God, the dreams that uh, Joseph experienced. And it reminded me of what God showed me about barren women. I know what I saw on the side of my bed is so true. I was sitting on the side of my bed. I was meditating. I was praying and seeking the Lord. And I saw two worlds. Now, I'm not saying I'm an apostle Paul. I'm not saying I was called up into a third heaven and saying, saw things not lawful to be uttered. But I tell you, I know when I see something. And I was sitting on the side of my bed meditating, and I saw two worlds in my room. There was two worlds in my bedroom. And I was able to see these two worlds. It was almost like looking at one with a right eye and looking at the other with the left eye. There was a world of darkness and there was a world of light. There's a world of carnality and there's a world of spirituality. How many understands what I'm talking about? And when I, when I was looking, looking at all this, I, I, was just, I was just amazed and I was thinking, man, it rains on the just and it rains on the unjust. And God began to let me see how that God is so near us all the time. God is near to the sinner and he's near to the saved. And the Lord began to show me how that when Abraham lied about who his wife was, because of the purpose of God, he would not allow any of those women where Abraham was to, to get impregnated. Now, honey, when God gets in the bed with you, I mean, please don't get carnal on me. I'm being spiritual now. I'm telling you, when God, when God would not let those women get pregnant because of Abraham and Sarah. Now, that let me know that God had to be in that camp and that God was under control of the sinners just like he was the saints. Are you listening to what I'm talking about? Now, it doesn't mean that they are saved. Because they've not accepted the blood of Christ. But I'm trying to tell you that it rains on the just and it rains on the unjust. If God had not protected his covenant for Abraham and Sarah, then they would have been under a curse if they touched Sarah. Are you listening to what I'm talking about? So what I'm trying to tell you is that in this world of darkness, there's still light. But here's the condemnation. Light has come. Men love darkness because their deeds are evil. Neither will they come to the light that their deeds may be made manifest. But to the called out ones, to the ones who, who God has chosen. In other words, he says, I choose you. He chose Joseph while the others were trying to kill what God chose. We have, oh Jesus. We have church people trying to kill what God chose in their own family. 
One in your own family gets saved and gets anointed and the other brothers and sisters hate them. What is that? It's carnality hating spirituality. And when you become spiritual, you automatically begin to see spiritual things. The natural man understandeth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. So what happens, someone gets spiritual. And I'm not talking about flaky stuff here. You know, I'm talking about you really get spiritual. You begin to see the call of God, the purpose of God. You begin to see that you're complete in Him. You begin to see that God has ordained you from the foundation of the world where you can have a rest in Him and have a peace in Him. You're not up one day and down the next day. You're not saved one day and lost the next day. You understand what I'm talking about, but you've come to God for the long haul. And you believe the one that started the good work and you is going to finish the work all of the way to the end. And yeah, you may have a headache, but I'm still saved. Hallelujah. Yeah, things may not be going exactly like I want them to, but I'm still saved. I'm a child of God. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivereth them out of them all. I'm going to make it because he's my way maker. You see, when you begin to get into a place like that where you can praise God at all times, is when you create an atmosphere that God has ordained for you. So we're going to go to the Word of God and read just a little bit. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. Having predestinated us under the adoption of sons by Jesus Christ to himself. So we have been, we have been adopted to Jesus Christ by himself. He chose you to be his. God, isn't that wonderful? He chose you to be his. Well, I, I don't look, maybe I don't look like he chose me. That has nothing to do with it. God chooses who, who, who he wills. He's sovereign. I mean, if he chose you and you didn't have any legs or arm, that's his responsibility. God chooses. He's sovereign. He has the right to choose whomsoever will, and whomsoever will he hardeneth. That's what the Bible said. I just quoted you scripture. But having predestinated us under the adoption of sons by Jesus Christ to himself. According to the good pleasure of his will. This was according to his will, not ours. To the praise of the glory of his grace through which he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Whenever he predestined me and called me, he made me accepted in the beloved. And now that he called me out, the church is composed of the called out, the one that God called out, and then he ordained them in order to be fruitful and that their fruit should remain. Now, we're in the world, but not of the world, but God said we're the light of the world. And so the enemy does not like your light. You understand what I'm talking about? That's why in this room, when I was sitting on the side of the bed, I believe God was letting me see the opposing forces of my life. Because God lighteth every man that belongs to him. Because he is the light of the world. Now he's made us the light of the world. So God puts a candle, as it were, inside of us in order that we become the light of the world. God chose us. We did not choose him. And since he chose us, it means that God is watching over his choosing. So we're put into the world as lambs among wolves. It doesn't mean that we don't have wolves to look out for. That's why you got to watch out for false prophets. See, every time trouble comes, the wolf runs. It's called sheep in wolves' clothing. Pretending to be something that you're not. Sometimes you have to bleed when you're a pastor. Sometimes you have to bleed when you're a shepherd. You will bleed yourself in order to go find the sheep that's bleeding. And friend, I want to tell you, it's not popular when you stand up before a religious world and begin to tell the world, the religious world, as it were, God still loves the sinner. He still loves the woman on the street. He still loves that person in the bar. He still loves those people that are out here that have never been told, hey, Jesus loves you, and Jesus wants to help you. Now, they may reject him, and they may refuse him, but you never know a seed sown today may come up ten years later. Because God said, I will hasten my word to perform it. So I'm telling you something. When you say something to a lost 
person under the anointing. God said, I will hasten my word to perform it, and it shall not return to me void. The seed that you sow today may come up many years later. So don't be afraid to tell someone Jesus loves you. And don't be afraid if they, you know, don't be embarrassed or humiliated if they turn away from you or make some smart remark. What it is, they're trying to fight what they need. But if your fight and your bite is not stronger than their fight, you understand what I'm talking about. You may be the cause of them never coming to the Lord. You may be the only voice or or the only light they will ever see. So we need to get on fire to tell someone about the security that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to go to another scripture before we get into Ephesians, if I may, to confirm that it's Jesus, the Father, that gives us to Jesus. We're going to go to St. John chapter 10, verse 26 through 30. But ye believe not because ye are not of my sheep. I want to stop right there. A lot of people, you can waste your life on them and never help them. I was preaching one time. I mean, really going after it with all my heart, fasting, praying, and seeking God, and I knew I was giving truth. And I went to bed one night. I I know the difference in a spiritual dream and when you just eat too much. Let me back up just a little bit before I tell this. Whenever the Lord was revealing to me how that God was near to all those people when Abraham lied, God began to show me how that God was so near to his purpose when he began to let Joseph dream spiritual dreams. See, Joseph was dreaming spiritual dreams, and he was so excited about what he saw beyond the darkness, or what he saw beyond the norm, what, what he saw beyond circumstance. He was looking at something divine, something that was anointed, which lets me know to have a dream to me is just something else. That means you go to bed and you begin to see all this stuff and it's the Holy Ghost revealing it to you. And you see it just as though you're there. And then because God put that in your spirit and in your mind, you want to go take a spiritual truth and tell your carnal brothers. And so that's what Joseph did, and it really got him in trouble. But one thing about it, it paid off in the end. You know what I'm talking about? God vindicated the spirituality of it in the end. And so what I want to, what I want to get across in this scripture here, as we read it, but you believe not because you're not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them what kind of life? And I give unto them eternal life. And here, see, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, or gave them to me, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. I remember reading this scripture one time to uh, another church member. In fact, I had I, I, I was studying the Word of God one day, and I thought, that, well, this is wonderful. I have never heard this before. I've been going to church for a long time, but I never heard this before. I was all excited. I found something. My God, I said, this is wonderful. And I, I just took that truth like Joseph did to his brother. And I started going to other church, but I said, look here what I found. Guess what I got back? You better be careful. That sounds like eternal security. That's what was said to me. It offended my poor soul. That's what my poor soul wants. I've had enough temporary. I said, I've had enough temporary stuff. I want something that doesn't depend on me. I want something that depends on him. 
And if he called me in his purpose and in his foreknowledge before the foundation of the world, that should give me security that God will perfect that that concerneth him. And there's a scripture that says that. God will perfect that that concerneth him. I know that I'm not perfect yet. I don't count myself so. (laughs) I know my wife thinks I am, but I'm not perfect yet. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) But what I like about it is that I am perfect in him because the Bible said, as he is, so are we in this present world. Because God is not looking at who I am. He's looking at who he is in purpose that called me and made me accepted. So when God made me accepted in him, he doesn't even look at me. He looks to the blood of the Son of God that he gave to redeem you. Isn't that wonderful? Therefore, we enter into a rest. I mean, I'll read this again and you can take it or whatever you want to do with it. Oh, I love this. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them temporary life. Didn't say that. I said I give unto them eternal life. Oh, I love that. And they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, means to me, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Let's go to John chapter 4, verse 13 through 15. Jesus answered and said unto her, talking about the woman with the well, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. Now let's see who he's talking to here. He's talking to a woman that had five husbands. And she's living with a joker that is not her husband, right? So he's not talking to somebody that was perfect. But he said, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whoso drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. This really touches my heart. And the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Who would not want this kind of drink? I mean, she can come as often as she should to this well and draw water. But she asked for the water that would be in her a well. Friend, my people have committed two evils. First of all, they've forsaken me, the fountain of living water. Second, they've hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that will hold no water. If you're depending on a religion that depends on your goodness, you have a bucket with a hole in it. And you're never going to get it full. Only God can give you a secure well. And that well God wants to put in you in order that you can draw water out of your own well. Even in the time of drought, you can still have water to drink because you believe in the purpose of God. How many Christians today are walking the floor and they're wringing their hands and they're worried about everything that comes along. And they're destroying their health because of worry, worry, worry. When God said There's a re- there remaineth the rest for the people of God. There is, I know we should be concerned about many things, but there's, there is a rest that all Christians need. It means that I'm resting even in the time of the storm. The apostle Paul and Silas was in prison, and at midnight they was able to sing a song. I have asked God to give me, along with the church, a song that we can sing at midnight. I'm not asking for a midnight experience, but if I have one, I want a song in my midnight hour. 
How many will say amen? I would like to have victory in the time of the storm, victory in the time of trouble. And God said he is a very present help in the time of trouble or in the hour of need. How many thousands of people am I talking to right now in the TV audience that need this message? How many people am I talking to right now that need hope, that need to know that God is a God of his word? That God will keep his promises to you. God said his promises are yea and amen to the glory of God to them that believe. He said, I will hasten my word to perform it. God said, I've honored my word even above my name. And God has given him a name that is above every name. God will not back up on his word one time. He has never lied. David said, I was young and now I'm old. Never have I seen the righteous forsaken, nor his children begging bread. God did not call you to be a beggar. God called you to be a son. And you can move into your inheritance if we can only get into the place that God has ordained for you. But you're going to have to come by faith and know you are who God says you are. That you can do what God says you can do. You don't have to settle for second best. I want to get into Ephesians, but I want to cover what I'm telling you first. But whosoever drank of this water that I shall give him shall never thirst. I like that. I mean, if you never thirst, that means you have plenty with you. But the water that I shall give him shall be a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman asked for that drink. John six thirty five, and Jesus saith unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. I believe it's the will of God that his children, not only you don't have to thirst, but you should never hunger. You should never have to be running all the time for a false prophet to give you a word. Parking lot, parking lot prophets are dangerous. And everything that comes through town is not always the voice of God. I mean, some of them have got lightning men and thunder running out their ministry every way. It's popping here and lightning there. And God said, I wasn't in that. He was in the still, small voice. I believe that every child of God ought to walk softly but carry a big stick and let your stick be Jesus. I mean, all the, them dogs that bark all the time, they don't bite. You better watch the old boy laying over there in the corner of the yard. Doesn't say a word, but he's just watching you. You come through the gate, he doesn't say a word. He just lays there. You get too close to the door, he'll get you. That's a real watchdog. You better watch these people that pray a lot and say little. They got their, ang- they, they got their answer at the midnight hour in the closet and they found out that nothing can shake our faith if it's his faith and they found out that nothing is going to keep us from going where he's ordained us to go oh glory to God and they found out he that's within us is greater than he that's in the world are you hearing what I'm talking about and so God has God has taken the called out and he has chosen them to be the apple of his eye He's watching over the church because he made a vow to himself concerning the church. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church. And he said something else. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against what I ordained. It doesn't mean that they won't try. Because I can go back in history and show you where the hillside was lit up with saints. When they took and put them on a cross and they soaked them in oil. And put them on a cross and lift them at the bottom of their feet. And the flames burned up their bodies. I can show you how all of the disciples went through a terrible death. But I can tell you through every bit of that that we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. And the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ covers every believer. I want you to know that. Wish I had another hour. The blood of Jesus Christ conquers a believer. I had an experience to happen because I had stress. I overdid it and, and uh, got a stress um, in my foot. And so if you see me hopping a little bit, it's not my legs, it's my foot. And uh, so I, I, it was bothering me. I went to the doctor and he sent me to get a, bo- a bone scan. And so when I went to get a bone scan, the, the fellow that was going to do it knew me. 
He said, I've listened to you on the radio for years. So we struck up a good con- conversation and had some good fellowship. And he gave me a shot of nuclear medicine. He said, go come back two or three hours and we'll see what's wrong with your foot. So I left and went back and come back. And I suppose he was a little better to me than others because he knew me. We had good fellowship, and he said, put your foot up here. And I put my foot up there, and he turned the light on. He said, look over on the wall. Had a machine over there. And that went to exactly, he said, your trouble's right there over those three toes. I was looking at it. It looked like a light bulb. I said, wow, that's amazing. What is that? That's blood. Getting to a place that you overdid. You hurt yourself. That's the blood for your body going to that wounded place to restore it back like it ought to be. And I'm telling you, friend, I said, oh, this will preach. Because I'm telling you, he didn't know it, but thank God my foot got hurt. In order that I can tell you that in the body of Christ, what needs to be happening is when there is a weakness or when there's something wrong, the blood from the body ought to be getting to that one spot to restore it instead of trying to turn it out and condemn it. Are you hearing what I'm talking about? We need the church to come back to redemption in order we can get the blood. To flow to the need. Because if we can get the blood to flow to the need, the need's going to be all right. Oh, let's stand and give God some praise right now because of the blood. Let's give Him some praise because of the blood. And ask the blood to get to every need in the body of Christ. Ask the blood to reach where you are. Come on, give Him a great praise there. Let's really give Him a praise. Thank God for the blood. Amen. And while I'm on that, I like to tell, see this, this is in the purpose of God. This is in the will of God. I was preaching one time, and this got this new revelation all of a sudden preaching. Whenever the spikes were driven in his left hand, that covers everything on that side. When the spikes was driven in the right hand, that covers everything on that side. When the thorns was put on his brow, that covers everything up here. When they drove the nails in his feet, that covers your walk. Whenever they put the stripes on his back, that covers your past. Friend, I'm trying to tell you that God wants us to be covered by the blood. Everything about us, that makes us complete in him. That means we're hid with Christ in God. Because when Jesus went back and sat down at the right hand of the Father... We sat down with him. I wish I had time to go into my message and and show you that we we died with him. We was resurrected with him. And now we ascended with him and we sat down with him. That is our rest. Raise your hand. I'm just going to predict it. You're more successful than you feel you are. You're more successful than you see yourself to be. It's time that the church will arise to the place that God has ordained them to be. I want you to give him a triple hand clap. I'm about through. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, let joy be your strength. Let joy be your strength. Hallelujah. Please just stand there. I always get three or four messages in one, miss my main message. (laughs) John 7, 37, the last day. That great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, Think about that. I want you to listen to this. In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried saying, what I'm trying to show you that there was a feast here and it was the last day. But there was an important message that he wanted to get across at that, at that time. And what was the message? He cried out.
if a man thirst. And Jesus stood and cried, saying, If a man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. That's how much God wants you to have this drink. He stood up and cried out and said, If any man thirst, he's talking about the same drink that the woman at the well asked him for. I want to know what it is you want. We need a drink from the well that Jesus provides. Thank God for natural water and natural food. But I need a drink the spiritual. I need some meat that's meat indeed. How about you? And God wants you to give you something that's lasting. I'm about through because I'm going to go into Revelation chapter 7 verse 16. And God consummates this by talking about the people that make heaven their home and that believe the message I'm telling you. And he said in Revelation 17, 16, they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. And watch this. Neither shall the sun light on them nor any heat. That is how God is protecting what he's called in the final. God said you're never going to hunger again. You're never going to thirst again. And beyond that, God said you won't have to worry about the weather. I'm not even going to let the sun shine on you. My God. The last scripture. No, we'll close with that one. That's good enough. Hold your hands up. While you're just standing there with your hands up, if you'll let me just give you a little bit out of Ephesians. Because that's what I really want, meant to preach from. In the 19th verse of Ephesians 1, well, 18, we'll start with verse... The eyes of your understanding, we're going with verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of His calling. Not yours, but the hope of His calling. And what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. See, this that I've been talking about is not your inheritance. It's God's inheritance in the saints. Don't you understand that if he lost you, he would lose his inheritance? And let me tell you, God is not going to lose his inheritance. His inheritance is in the saints. And what is the exceeding grace of his power to us would who believe according to the working of his mighty power? Which when he which when he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. For above all principalities and powers and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet. And give him to be the head over all things to the church. Which is his body. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. This is not a little thing. And in my closing I want to read it again because I want you to get it. What I'm trying to get you to understand is the kingdom of God is in you. And the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our Christ. Let it be done in earth even as it is in heaven. God has taken a heavenly and placed it in you. Now watch it. He said, you are going to occupy till I come. He turned it all over to you. He turned this whole thing over to us. But he give us the Holy Spirit. Are you listening? He give us the Holy Ghost. 
but I'm trying to tell you until the church will arise to the deposit that God put in them, we'll still just be going to church. We'll still be just, you do, do, are you getting what I'm talking about? When you understand who you are, you are here to occupy. You are here to possess. You are here to take over. And the reason that we're on Social Security, the world is on Social Security, is because the church did not pray and get the revelation as to who they are because when you do, there's going to be some things turned around even in our politics and even in our government because God never intended for everything you have to go to the government. Now, are you running our government down? No, they're doing the best they know. But what I'm trying to tell you is the church is not arrived at what God wanted you to know. Whenever he said, let it be done on earth, even as it is in heaven, I can assure you that in God's kingdom, he knew the fish that had the money in his mouth. And whenever the church gets into the ordained place that God has called them to be, we're going to have some knowledge and know that God give us power to get well. It's not right for the drunks and all of the sinners of the world to be driving, they're flying their airplanes and driving around in every kind of automobile and living in their millions and millions dollar houses and you a pauper when you're a believer. I'm just trying to tell you there's a turnaround coming. There is a turnaround coming. There's a turnaround coming. But not in the, until the church will open her eyes. And begin to realize the power you have when you get into the closet to pray. Now, verse 22, let me read it and I'll close it, I promise. And the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. His inheritance is in you. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? I'm not believing this according to my power. I'm believing this according to his mighty power because he's the only one that can do what I'm talking about. But don't forget, he's the one that made us accepted in the beloved. And if he calls you, he's able to enable you which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. For above all principality and power and might and dominion and in, in every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. You are his body and he lives in you. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. You are to be the fullness of God. Where is he? <laughs> he that's within you is greater than he that's in the world. But you've got to wake him up. He can steal the storm in your life if you will wake him up and say, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Wouldn't be quiet. I know I'm going to tell one more because I said I'd close with that, but I'm not. Got one more scripture that I'm going to close with. This is good. If it wasn't good, I wouldn't care, keep you here another minute. In verse 11 of Colossians 1, Strengthened with all might, according to the glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. See, there is a joyfulness when you're in God's war because you know you're right in the center of God's will. Giving thanks, see there, giving thanks unto the Father who hath made us fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath, the, who, who hath, who hath, let me, let me preach to me, Raymond, I'm reading this to you. Oh, Raymond, this is to you, buddy. Some of them turned you off, but go ahead and preach it. Okay, Raymond, who hath delivered you, Raymond, from the power of darkness? Raymond, I'm talking to you. And hath translated you, boy, 
into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, Raymond, you grab hold of that. It don't make any difference if they shout or not. It's for you, Raymond. Hallelujah to God. You, this is your inheritance. You grab a hold of it and know it's for you. No, you are what I am according to my purpose. Are you listening to me? Verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Doesn't make any difference whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And so all he does is use the negative on the enemy. And he is before all things. And by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church. Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That in all things he might have the preeminence. Uh, preeminence. That means that all that's going on in your life, God wants the preeminence. God has control on it. And all he wants you to do is get in line with him. Because the Father and Jesus are one. And what he chose, he chose in him. And so it is in him that we live and move and have our being. And if it's in him we live and move and have our being, let us arise. And believe that what God says about us is ours now. Not coming, it's ours now. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of the cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be thrones in the earth or things in heaven. And you, that were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. I can see Slewfoot the devil coming along and telling God what all is wrong with you. But I can hear the Son of God say back, but you don't understand through my blood. I made them accepted and unreprovable. There's nothing you can say about them that I haven't taken care of. Oh, come on. Let's give God a hand. I just, I, I'd like to take another chapter, but I'm through. You've been watching the Words of Life broadcast with Reverend Raymond Beard. You can obtain a copy of today's message by simply writing Words of Life Broadcast, P.O. Box 22592, Jackson, Mississippi, 39225. We want to join our faith with yours regarding your very special prayer requests. So please write to us. Or you may simply dial area code 601-948-5591. Until the next time, may God richly bless you is our sincere prayer.